wa asyhadu anna Muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'du <coughs> Ibu-ibu, bapak-bapak, adik-adik anak muda rahimakumullah jamaah pengajian wasalahat pagi yang dimuliakan oleh Allah Subhanahu wa taala Alhamdulillah pada pagi hari ini kembali kita dibangunkan oleh Allah Subhanahu wa taala dari meninggal kita sebentar saat kita tidur dan alhamdulillah ruh kita dikembalikan oleh Allah Subhanahu wa taala sehingga kita bisa bangun kembali. Alhamdulillah Pak Aiman juga bisa kembali lagi ke Westall setelah agak lama hilang ini. Dan pagi ini agak sedikit berkurang, tampak kelihatannya agak sedikit kosong karena sebagian besar eh, jamaah Westall ada yang termasuk yang jamaah had pagi sedang camping ya ke Lon. Saya tanya tadi ke Pak Marzuki kenapa nggak ikut? Saya kan belum senior kata Pak Marzuki. Jadi Pak Marzuki itu masih 35an kayaknya umurnya. Karena kalau badminton 5 5 game aja masih kuat ya. Jadi sekarang sebagian besar para veteran perang Vietnam, Afghanistan itu sedang camping sekarang ya di sana. Da, pada Dang CS dan teman-teman termasuk beberapa orang jamaah kita Chef Barja sama Chef Johana juga ikut serta ke sana. Termasuk Pak Ade juga sebagai ininya apa namanya? Chief the mission-nya. Bapak-bapak rahimakumullah, uh, jadi pada hari ini Ustaz Gunggun tidak akan hadir karena beliau di sana sebagai kokojonya. Tapi saya sudah mampu mengundang sebagai pengantinya dua orang seperti biasa. Yang pertama adalah Ustaz Fadil yang sudah lama menghilang. Alhamdulillah sekarang beliau sudah kembali lagi tapi on the way. Cuma on the way-nya jadi dari Hampton Park. Jadi mungkin agak setengah jam mungkin on the way-nya ya. Yang kedua juga Ustaz Usep, insya Allah juga on the way katanya. Ya, jadi karena on the way saya akan run away juga kalau begitu ya. Ya, sebagai penanggung jawab ya kalau yang dua-duanya sedang on the way ya saya harus jangan run away ya. Insya Allah sambil menunggu Ustaz Fadil, Insya Allah yang on the way dan Ustaz Dusep, saya akan mengisi sampai mereka datang. Bapak Ibu Rahimahumullah, Salah satu kitab yang sering kita dengar adalah Al-Hadis Al-Arba'in Karangan siapa? Pernah mendengar? Imam Nawawi yang sangat terkenal ya Kumpulan Hadis-hadis sebetulnya Jumlahnya tidak pas 40 Ada 42 kalau tidak salah Tapi disebutnya dengan Arba'in Istilah Arba'in dari bahasa Arab Arba'un yang artinya 40 ya Salah satu istil Arba'in adalah ketika kita naik haji Pak Iman masih ingat apa itu Arba'in, di mana itu? Di Madinah ya, kalau kita naik haji Disunatkan untuk Arba'in Apa itu Arba'in di Madinah ketika naik haji? Disunatkan untuk sholat berjamaah di Masjid Nabawi sebanyak berapa waktu? 40 waktu, berarti berapa hari itu? Ya, kalau sholatnya Pak Iman 5 kali berarti 8 kalau Pak Iman salatnya 6 kali kelebihan itu mah ya itu jama, itu Islamnya Islam mana itu kalau salatnya 6 kali ya <tuh> Salah satu dari hadis Arba'in itu yang akan saya bacakan adalah ini hadis yang nomor 7 al sabi tentang Ad-Dinu An-Nasihah Kata Rasulullah SAW Ad-Dinu An-Nasihah Agama itu adalah nasihat. Jadi kadang-kadang Rasul itu memberikan ungkapan simplifying Islam, Islam. menyederhanakan agama penjelasan tentang Islam supaya mudah dipahami oleh para sahabat. Ketika Rasul mengatakan al haji Arafah, haji itu adalah Arafah. Oh, kok, kok, kayaknya ini banget ya, simpel. Haji pokoknya kalau kita ke Arafah itu namanya haji. Kalau nggak ke Arafah itu namanya umroh. Jadi kadang-kadang Rasul membuat 
mesimplifying, menyederhanakan istilah agama. Ini juga sangat dalam sebuah pertemuan di depan para sahabat yang Rasul bersabda Adinu an nasihah. Agama itu ya nasihat. Ini hadis diriwayatkan dari Abi Ruqayyah Tamim Ibni Aus Ad-Dairi radhiyallahu anhu. Hadis diriwayatkan oleh Abi Ruqayyah dan diriwayatkan juga oleh Muslim jadi hadis sahih. Para sahabat bertanya Ya kita tahu Rasul nasihat ya tahulah nasihat itu kan apa yang tahu dari jadi, jadi bahasa Indonesia kan nasihat dari bahasa Arab itu adinu an nasihah agama itu adalah nasihat oh ya tahu saya nasihat bahasa Inggrisnya hakim do you know what nasihat in English nggak tahu ini karena orang Melbourne ini bukan orang Jakarta ya advice mungkin ya counseling Oh oke. Okay. Kemudian para sahabat bertanya, untuk siapa Rasul? Kata Rasulullah SAW, Lillah. Untuk Allah. Wali Rasuli dan untuk para Rasulnya. Wali kitabi dan untuk kitab-kitabnya. Wali aimatil muslimi dan untuk para pemimpin orang-orang muslim. Wa amatihim dan untuk semua umat muslim dan mukmin. Para sahabat bertanya, kok nasihat kau untuk Allah? Masa Allah perlu dinasehati? Kok nasihat kau untuk Rasul? Bukannya Rasul yang suka memberi nasihat kepada kami, kepada kita. Nasihat kau untuk likutubi, untuk kitab-kitabnya. Kok bagaimana? Ternyata Bapak Ibu Rahimahumullah, Imam Nawawi, beliau menjelaskan beberapa pengertian Nasehat itu apa sih? Masa kita menasehati Allah? Kebalik kali kita beriman ya. Masa kita menasehati Rasul? Sebaliknya malahan kita mendengarkan nasihat tausiah dari Rasulullah SAW. Ternyata kata Imam Nawawi ada beberapa pengertian nasehat. Yang paling banyak kita tahu adalah yang sekarang kita sing-sing kita adalah nasehat ya begitu nih itu adalah mengharapkan memberikan wejangan pitutur atau pengarahan kepada orang lain agar orang tersebut mau mendengarkan dan memahami kemudian mengikuti ayam pangkang kita katakan itu yang kita pahami selama ini karena sehat ya anak kita misalnya nah jangan banyak makan es krim ya jangan banyak makan es kenapa nanti batuk misalnya kata orang tuanya Tapi kata anak kita, enggak, kok enggak batuk? Ya kalau kebanyakan nanti batuk. Tapi anak orang tuanya menyuruh menalang anaknya untuk makan es krim, tapi di kulkasnya banyak es krimnya, disimpan. Udah gitu freezernya di bagian bawah lagi kan, anaknya, oh iya, iya, iya. Tapi belakang begitu orang tuanya enggak ada, tinggal buka kan kulkasnya. Karena kulkasnya di bawahnya penuh dengan es krim. Itu nasihat. Yang pertama itu, pengerti nasihat yang sering, yang sangat kita kenal. Ternyata ada beberapa pengertian nasihat yang mungkin dalam konteks ini tadi nasihat untuk Allah, nasihat untuk Rasul, nasihat untuk kitab-kitabnya. Yang kedua adalah kata Imam Nawawi yang artinya nasihat itu adalah nashur rajul taubahu idza khatuhu. Seorang tukang jahit ya. Penjahit Penjahit itu laki-laki atau perempuan? Laki-laki atau perempuan menjahit? Kalau laki-laki, menjahat. <laughs> laki-laki perempuan menjahit sama-sama penjahitnya ya. <tuh> seorang penjahit, apa pekerjaan seorang penjahit? Apa itu menjahit? Menggabungkan antara potongan-potongan kain kan? Dipotong-potong. Ini untuk tangan, baju misalnya dijahit, jadilah tangannya. Ini potong-potong, ini untuk bagian kerahnya disambungkan, jadilah kerah. Begitu juga untuk bagian badannya dipotong, disambung-sambungkan. Ternyata nasihat itu juga, juga artinya menyambungkan potongan-potongan, artinya. 
Jadi bagaimana nasihat kepada Allah, kepada kitabnya, kepada Rasulullah adalah menyambungkan diri kita dengan Allah. Apa maksudnya? Fakola ulama Allah mengatakan Uaman nasihatulillah Makanya sekarang kita akan memfokuskan artinya yang pertama yang kedua dulu Yang menyambungkan tadi Menyambungkan diri kita dengan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Menyambungkan diri kita dengan Rasulullah s.a.w Apa artinya? Fama'anaha yan sarifu ilal imani billah Yang pertama adalah bagaimana kita menyambungkan diri kita dengan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adalah Al-imanu billah Iman kepada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Itu yang pertama pondasi keimanan kita Dalam hadis lain dikatakan Iman levelnya di atas Islam Ketika para kaum Quraisy mengatakan kepada Rasulullah SAW Aman nabillah Kita sudah beriman ya Rasul Kata Rasul belum, kamu sebetulnya belum beriman Baru aslamna Karena levelnya di atas keislaman Kalau seorang itu sudah mengucapkan dua kalimat syahadat Sudah mengucapkan Uh, melakukan salat sudah melakukan zakat, sudah melakukan puasa Ramadan Itu disebut dengan aslamna, kita baru berislam, belum beriman Karena iman itu dibalik Mengapa kita alasan berzakat, mengapa kita alasan berpuasa Mengapa kita di Melbourne misalnya Pemeruzuki, summer Yang subuhnya jam 3 Yang maghrib jam 9, jam 10 Tapi kok mau-maunya berpuasa, mengapa itu? Ternyata karena dalam hatinya ada iman Meyakini bahwa ini perintah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Mau datangnya bulan Juli, mau bulan Desember, mau bulan Maret Kalau sudah saatnya bulan puasa, ya puasa saja Mau bekerjanya di gedung yang ber-AC atau di luar Ya kalau sudah saatnya bulan puasa, ya puasa saja Itulah iman Jadi yang pertama adalah Iman kepada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Sekarang ini kan banyak orang yang tidak percaya kepada Allah ya Apa enggak ada Allah itu Yang ada semua kita semua ini ya sudah the nature of law Udah hukumnya alam aja begini Ada siang, ada malam, ada dingin, ada panas, ada musim gugur segala macam Kalau kita lapar, enggak makan kita lapar Kalau udah kita makan ya udah enggak lapar lagi Kalau kita lagi uh, Apa namanya Lagi gerah kita mandi Badan kita menjadi bersih Dari nanti kotor lagi Makanya ada Pak Eman tuh kalau ditanya Pak Eman udah mandi belum? Ngapain mandi? Nanti kan kotor lagi badannya Kalau mandi sekarang juga nanti kotor lagi katanya. Makanya Pak Eman kadang-kadang mandinya agak jarang ya Karena meskipun mandi nanti kan kotor lagi Udah aja nanti aja mandinya gitu ya, Manja mandi jarang katanya Betul-betul yang berbadan ya <tuh> One of you, yang kedua setelah beriman adalah Nasihat untuk Allah itu adalah yang kedua adalah One of you syirik anhu Menghilangkan kesyirikan kepada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Itu namanya nasihat untuk Allah Apa syirik? Syarikat Persyirikatan Kalau dia bahasanya jadi persyirikatan ya Persyirikatan bangsa-bangsa Apa itu syarikat? Bersekongkol, berkumpul ya Jadi artinya Allah itu ada Asistennya Mungkin kita berpikir Kenapa Allah memiliki Ada malaikat Untuk mengirimkan wahyu kepada Rasul Ada malaikat Jibril Untuk mencabut nyawa ada malaikat Malaikat apa itu? Yang bertugas mencabut nyawa Ijra'il Untuk men- Kiamat Malaikat apa? Menurut riwayat Malaikat Israfil itu yang tugasnya meniup sangka kala itu sejak diciptakan sejak sampai sekarang itu belum perkedip matanya. Matanya selalu melihat ke arah Allah Subhanahu wa taala. Mengapa? Karena khawatir ketika Allah mengatakan Israfil, tiup sangka kala khawatir dia tuh enggak dengar gitu enggak melihat. Jadi menurut riwayat sampai sekarang sejak awal diciptakan sampai sekarang malaikat Israfil itu belum mengedip Melihat ke arah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Khawatir kalau-kalau tiba-tiba Allah mengatakan Kiamat ya Sofil Khawatir nggak kedengaran sama dia Matanya gini terus Berarti apa itu? 
Berarti mereka Israel tahu bahwa kiamat itu sebentar lagi. Satu saat kalau tiba-tiba Allah mengatakan kiamat, dia khawatir nggak kedengaran atau miss sehingga dia matanya nggak berani menutup berkedip. Itu malaikat Israel. Jadi Allah, apa artinya Allah nggak berkuasa itu? Kok ada malaikat, ada asistennya? Karena ketika Allah akan menciptakan manusia pertama Adam, kenapa sih Allah mengajak berdialog dengan malaikat dan jin? tentang siapa itu Adam, bagaimana sifat-sifat Adam. Mengapa Allah Subhanahu wa taala untuk mendatangkan wahyu harus mengirim malaikat Jibril? Apakah Allah enggak mampu untuk sendiri saja langsung kepada Rasulullah SAW? Nah, ini yang perlu kita hati-hati jangan sampai kita berkeyakinan bahwa oh kayaknya Allah perlu asisten. Waalaikumsalam Ustaz Fadil. Jadi <tuh> Itu hanya untuk menjelaskan bagaimana kepada manusia Karena kita manusia sebagai makhluk yang dohir Kita bukan makhluk yang batin Agar kita bisa mampu memahami Bagaimana proses turunnya wahyu misalnya Kepada Rasulullah SAW Maka Allah menurunkan dalam bentuk Malaikat Jibril Dan Malaikat Jibril juga Menampakkan diri seperti manusia Yang kadang-kadang berpakaian serba putih Kemudian datang tiba-tiba ketika Rasul <tuh> sedang berkumpul dengan para sahabatnya tiba-tiba datang dan duduk ke Rasulullah SAW langsung bertanya <tuh> mahu wal Islam ada orang tamu baru datang tiba-tiba langsung nanya apa sih Islam itu dijawab oleh Rasulullah SAW al Islamu adalah syahadat salat zakat ketika dia mengatakan kamu benar loh kok nanya kok malah kamu benar ini nanya pengetes sih apa mahu wal iman iman itu apa Di jalan Rasul iman itu adalah beriman kepada Allah, kepada Rasul dan lain sebagainya Dia mengatakan Sodakta, benar kamu Loh, Ini nanya kok Ngetes ini kayaknya ini Siapa sih ini, ini tamu Begitu waktu pergi Kata para sahabat, siapa ya Rasul tadi Dia adalah Jibril Wah kira-kira kalau sekarang ada orang begitu ya Tiba-tiba datang ke Ferry orang baju-baju putih Fair apa itu Islam Apa antun ya Apalagi tanya apa itu iman ya? Oh apa itu iman? Oh iman ya teman saya yang tinggalnya di Fringe Street sana itu katanya. Nah, tanya lagi ya. Jadi yang kedua adalah anafir syirik. Nasihat kita kepada Allah adalah jangan pernah kita mensyirikan berbuat syirik kepada Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Karena saudara Fadil sudah datang, saudara Sabdi sudah datang. Saya kata ini cuma intro saja. Nanti Insya Allah selanjutnya akan dilanjutkan pada Ahad pagi berikutnya insya Allah Saya mempersiapkan Ustaz Fadil Ini karena banyak anak-anak muda yang tidak mengerti bahasa Indonesia ini Jadi Ustaz Fadil saya minta untuk Bahasa Inggris campur bahasa Indonesia Ada Sundanya juga sedikit lah Silahkan Ustaz Fadil Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Assalamualaikum Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalam Ala ashrafil khalqi wal mursanin Nabiyuna Muhammadin Alayhi afdalu salati wa atamu taslim Allahumma la ilmanana Illa ma'allamtana Innaka anta al-alimu hakim Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'na Wa anfa'na bima allamtana Wa zinna ilma Wa la hawla wa la quwata Illa billahi la'ani al-azim اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والاكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله الكرام لا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين ثم اما بعد Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, all praise and thanks is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all our deeds and our efforts towards pleasing Him 
we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his peace and blessings upon our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Mustafa, the chosen one, and upon his family and companions and all to all those who follow him to the end of days. Ameen. Alhamdulillah, it's been a, I feel like a stranger again, coming back here, feels like he's been here a long time. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I hope you haven't forgotten me, because I haven't forgotten you. With all the beautiful faces, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your consistency. And uh, we all know the, uh, the famous uh, hadith, um, or the, the uh, in fact, the from the Quran talks about the, the importance of that being steadfast you know you know the ones that you know they they clarify and they they say that without a doubt you know they say that our master is Allah that I'm here in existence in this world not for any vain purpose I'm not here just to sleep and eat and to go to school and to go work and not to have any real purpose in life. Rather, I'm here for the purpose of worshipping my Creator, my Master. He has given me everything that I need to pass through this life. He has given me, He has you know, he's written for me everything that I'm going to get from the time I leave the womb of my mother. In fact, from the time I was in the womb of my mother. You know, it's an amazing commentary that I heard from one of my teachers. They say, you know, we live in this world and sometimes we think, subhanAllah, and life is hard. You know, if we, you know, if we're not so, if we find, you know, we're, we're in some sort of struggle, you know, whether it's financial, whether it's, you know, family related, there's some sort of struggle going on in our life. And, you know, specifically speaking, especially for when, you know, when we, when we grow up and as we get older, the priorities in life change, you know, as you get older, it's no longer just about having fun and entertainment, even though it's you know, a bit of a controversy these days, you know, 30 years old men are still living with their mum and playing video games on the TV. So I'm not sure what growing up in this day and age is really, really is, right? But the idea of the man growing up and then providing for himself, you know, going up and, you know, achieving the education, going to work, providing food uh, and support for himself and his family, and the idea of this continuous struggle just to survive. And now with the economy going down and, you know, very difficult now to find a job and things are getting tough, it becomes a lot more harder. And the realization of how hard things are be. Whereas, where, you know, and sometimes we just think, man, I just wish, you know, things just can just come to me. You know, I just wish sometimes, you know, I'm, Alhamdulillah, I believe in Allah, I trust in Allah, but... You know, why is it so hard? You know, I've got to struggle, got to go out there, wake up in the morning, you know, f for those who, um, you know, who spread the news, literally spread the news in the morning. They, um, they get, wake up in the morning, get paid a meal, you know, a mealy rate, and you know, just, just, and alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. Yani this is all, of course, all from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sometimes we think, you know, what if Allah just put things in front of me, you know, put all my rizq right in front of me, you know, like, like the chickens, you know, you can feed a chicken, you can feed chickens two ways, you can either get the seeds and just throw them all around the ground and say, here, you know, chickens, and let the chicken look for the, you know, look for the seed, and you see them pecking over here, and then once the food is finished, they go over there and look for more food and peck over here and peck over there, or you can get all the seeds all in one plate and put it right in front of the chicken. So the chicken doesn't even have to move, it just stays in one place and pecks at that one place where all the food is, right? And, so, and Allah subhanahu, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything is possible. For Allah, if He had wanted to, He could put a place, all of our rizq in one place, and we don't even need to move. But of course, this is not the sunnah of Allah. But Allah can do it. How? Just like when we were in the wombs of our mothers. When we were in our wombs of the mothers, right? We had no education. We had no experience in any work. We didn't have to go out and you know, search for the sustenance. We were just sitting in the womb, chilling out, relaxing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving us everything we need. The oxygen, the food, everything was given to us. We were nurtured and nourished in the womb of our mothers without even trying. Why? Because the, the baby at that state 
is in complete reliance on Allah. Complete reliance on Allah. The complete tawakkal, the complete reliance, and they fully, fully realize the need that they are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah gives that baby everything it needs without worrying about anything. But then the baby comes out into this world and it starts to grow and to become strong, stronger and it has different abilities. It learns to crawl, to, you know, to stand up, to walk, to run, and then all of a sudden it feels independent. And more and more the baby now, this human being, is now becoming more and more dependent on themselves and less dependent on Allah. And so Allah says, okay, if you think you are dependent on yourself, then you will continue to try. Continue to try. And so what we need to do is we need to turn back. To put that reliance back on Allah. To put the principle of our life is that, yeah, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has provided for me. And we know from the ahadith, from the time we were in the womb of our mothers, Allah has already written down for us everything. Right? We know the famous ahadith, right? When, uh, you know, when, uh, in the beginning, Allah talks about the hadith, right? Talks about the beginning of creation. For the first 40 days, a clot of blood for the, for the next 40 days. You know, the, the stages of the embryo system, right? We go, and at, once it reaches the four-month stage, 120 days, right? And it's a big brother's four months, anyone for four months? This is, one, this is one, it's actually one of the dalils they use, right? One of the dalils that the tabli use about the four months is from this hadith. Because when after four months the baby is now, the angel comes to the baby at four months and breathes. Uh, Allah sends the, 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 the ruh right into the baby. And so that's why at four months the baby is now alive. All right? And at that point, the cat be rizqihi. Right? The angels now, uh, writ, uh, Allah has written, has written now for him now, what? All of his sustenance. Everything that this human being will get in this life has already been written down. And that we will never leave this, and from the hadith of the, 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 the human being will not leave this world until he has received everything that Allah has written for him. Right? What else is written at that time? What ajali, right? And the time of his death has already been determined. Each and every one of us, there is no doubt that our time will come. You know, our time one day will come. There's no question about it. When? That is the question. Do we need to worry about it? When? Do we need to worry about when we're going to die? Absolutely. Because we know that when we die, it's only the beginning. When we die, it is only going to be the beginning. Beginning of what? That's what we need to worry about. <laughs> is it going to be the beginning of an eternal journey of happiness? or an eternal journey of sadness. May Allah protect us and save us from this. And so, you know, at that time, everything's been written for that baby, right? What, that, what, what the human being is going to be doing in that life, everything is written then. And so, when we, want to, when we turn back to Allah and we rely again, we put our full trust and reliance back in Allah, the more trust we put in Allah, Right. As I was saying, yeah. So the four months is is a time that, that you know that, that life is breathing into. So they say it's like a new life after four months. But anyway, so when we want this, this is what we need to do. So Alhamdulillah, you know, we we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to to give us that realization and enable us to become of those who can put our trust and full faith in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So in the Qawlar when Allah thumma staqam when I think we've covered this before, that and they, and they remain steadfast, or they remain straightened, or they remain in a place where they are firm, right? They remain firm against all odds, against all the conditions, wet weather, cold weather, 
yet we still come. Alhamdulillah. You know, may Allah reward you. But what is what is what does Allah say for those who can fulfill these conditions? To believe that to, to, to acknowledge and believe that Allah is the master and then to remain firm. And this is the main this is the main I love to repeat this. Tatanazalu alayhimun malaika. That's right. And of course there's a few tafsir among the ulama as to when this time is actually you know, when Allah is actually talking about is it actually during his life, right? Uh, and some scholars so say even at the time of death and even at the, after the time of death when Allah says that the angels will descend upon him. Right? The angels will descend upon him. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا Right? And this is amazing. Giving glad tidings, you know? Just assuring us. Assuring, making, you know, just cal- is giving us this calm. And so what you find in most tafsir is, depending on the tafsir that you read, is, is at the time of death. You know, the time of uncertainty, the time people are worried. You know, what's happening now at the deathbed? You know, they don't know, they, they, you know, the, the veils have been lifted. They can start to see the next life, right? And now they're worried, now they're concerned. The angels are coming down. And they're saying, La takhafu. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't worry, it's all good. Right? And don't be sad. Right? Because there'll be there's this idea of this fear, right? What's gonna happen next? And then they'll come to this realization, maybe I haven't done enough. Maybe my salah wasn't good enough. Maybe my amal wasn't complete. Oh, I just committed that wrong, I committed that sin. Allah takha wala tahzanu wa abshiru bil jannah. And here are the glad tidings of Jannah. Congratulations. You have just become a member of Jannah. Welcome to the club. SubhanAllah. And I continue. نَحْنُ وَأَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرِ right? We were companions. We've been with you. And this is an amazing thing, right? We've been with you. And we're going to be with your fr- I don't know, We're going to be your close friends. Right, and we were cl- close friends in this life. We were with you the whole way. Yusuf? Yusuf, no. Right? We were your close friends, you know? And so you, and so you think to yourself, subhanAllah, you know, sometimes we don't realize the role that angels play in our life. You know, one of my teachers said that Allah has, has placed angels around us to prevent things from happening to us. To be the causes of protection for us. Even at the eyelids. You know, even at the eyelids. You know, we, we know the, the scientific reason and phenomenon behind the eyelid is, you know, to protect the eyes from dust and things like that. But this is only what we see with the eyes. You know, it's like the birds, yeah? You see? Okay. It's like the birds. We think logically, yeah, the bird is flapping its wings. And, you know, from the notion and, the, you know, from the flow of the wind and, you know, the pressure that is creating underneath, it's lifting the bird. And that's how the bird is flying. But Allah reminds us in Surah Al-Mulk that it's not the bird's wing. All the bird is doing is opening and closing its wings. But it is only being able to float in the air by what? By the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. And, and therefore, that's why they were saying, that's why even the eyelids and, you know, protecting ourselves from dust and, you know, all these bacteria out there, you know, people are so pedantic, you know, washing their hands with soap and ensuring that we don't get, you know, all these bacteria, food fall, falls on the floor, you know. And, you know, as, as, you know, as parents, sometimes we care, you know, the, the child is eating, the food falls on the floor, we say, no, don't touch it, leave it on the floor, Right? But we are taught in our deen that, no, we should pick it up, right? We should pick it up, blow on it, ensure there's no more, you know, un- unless, of course, it's, you know, it's uh, very dirty and impure. We should blow on it, make sure it's clean, and then eat it and continue to eat it. Right? Or even with, uh, I mean, I know some parents are pedantic about eating with the hands. SubhanAllah. You know, it, let alone licking the hands. You know, if you, you know, I used to go to the you know public school when I was young, 
and my mum always taught me to lick hands, you know. So after you eat it, I'm licking my hands, and all, everyone's getting grossed out. Oh, yuck. Yuck. You're disgusting, man. You know? Yet in our deen, we learn, you know, this is uh, among, among, the, in, among the things that we learn, right? Among the etiquettes of eating, right? We learn to eat with a hand. And then later we learn through science that the hand has, yes, it does have bacteria, but it also has bacteria which are good for us, which we need in the hands. I can't remember when I, when I came across this article. It was a long time ago because uh, we used to do a class back in, uh, in, the, in the schooling days uh, regarding you know, the adab and, the, you know, the, and there's, there's some amazing uh, books and scholars that have gone over this but the, uh, the amazing scientific benefits of sunnah right? when I say sunnah I mean uh, the, uh, the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam etiquette in our life you know, and uh, it's such an amazing phenomenon because, you know, of course, when we, when we do, when we follow through, you know, we believe in Allah, we, we follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Atiyahullah wa Atiyahur Rasul, you know, we have to obey Allah, we obey the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we truly love Allah, then we truly we should follow the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Then we know all of these. And so we look into that, okay, whatever the Prophet did, I will follow. I know that this is the, 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 the road to success, is following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we learn from the Sunnah, from everything that he did, from the time, from the way he slept, to the, to the way he even woke up, to what he did after waking up, to the way he, when he prayed, when he, ate, when he ate, when he interacted with people, when he even went to the toilet. There is nothing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has not taught us, right? So we have this idea, and so we, when, you, when you further look into <laughs> when we further look into uh, from the scientific point of view, so many benefits. And I think I've covered this a long time ago, and I'm sure you've learned it. But for even simple things like um, you know the going to sleep on the right, why should we sleep on the right side? Now, we know the Sunnah of the Prophet is to sleep. Not on our backs, but on, on our rights. And I remember when I was young and I learned this, I used to love, the, I, think, I, think when I, was, I think maybe 12 or 13 when I learned this, and I used to love the only way I could sleep was on my stomach. You know, go to turn on the stomach and get in a nice position and you sleep. And then you were told, no, no, the Prophet, this is not the way, this is the way the shaitan sleeps. Don't sleep like this. Sleep like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How? On your right side. And I thought to myself, and I said, why right side? You know, why, right, why, not, right, why not left side? And we, and we, we, we know, why? Because the heart, right, all the vital organs are on the right side. And so what happens is when you sleep, if you had to sleep on your left side, there'll be pressure on the heart. Right? There'll be pressure on the heart, on the left side, sorry. Right? And so when you sleep on the right side, the pressure is taking off the heart. Which is, you know, for, for those who are trained in first aid, or any basic level of first aid, if someone is unconscious, or if someone is hurt, what you should do is, Turn them on their right side. If someone is going through a fit or going through some sort of medical emergency, you put them on the right side. SubhanAllah. Right? Simple things. You know, eating with the hands. You know, and I remember one sunnah of eating with three fingers. And I used to think, what's this idea of eating with three fingers? And I, I know us Indonesians, you know, we eat rice. How much rice are you going to pick up with, especially if you're using basmati rice, right? How much rice are you going to literally pick up with three fingers? So what, what is the benefit? What's the benefit of three fingers? You're controlling the portions you put in your mouth. You're controlling the portions you let, you, you, don't, you, you don't put pressure on the stomach to, to 
to process the food. You know, for some brothers, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm not guilty of this, sometimes the food is so good you just swallow it. <laughs> you know? You take a bite of the pizza, oh, so good, and one, two bites, and it's in the stomach. And so what now, now the stomach is under a lot of pressure. Because it now it needs to f work harder to break down the food. And so a small pour, three fingers, subhanAllah. Eating with the right hand, you know, why right hand? Science benefit of the right hand is that there's bacteria in the right hand that the left hand doesn't have, that the stomach needs. And these are all fitra, really. It's like the baby, uh, the baby, and of course, and of course, if, if you look into nature, and you can really, really appreciate nature if you, you know, watch those. I really recommend the uh, really good, high quality, high definition quality of David Attenberg. Right, and for those who know who he is, uh, for those who know who he is, he is a person who has spent his life studying nature, and not just studying nature and animals, but documenting them and you learn the amazing life and of course with the, with the technology of today they get into the life of the animal wherever the animal is whether it's in the water they attach cameras to it you know or anything in the ground and they document all these things and one of the amazing things i saw was the koala you know and you think to yourself and even the cats you know i think maybe one more or more closer example to home is the cat you know why do you find cats eating grass? Have you seen cats eating grass? When? When they are sick. When they are sick, they eat grass. Right? And you see them when they have babies. Where, 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 is, where is all the, the poo and the, and the urine of the babies? Where is it? The cat is eating it. The mother is eating it. Because there is bacteria that it needs to provide the milk for the babies. And to also give it health after its birth. It's an amazing phenomenon. The baby koala. All it eats is the poo of something. I think it's mother's poo or, the, or its own poo or something like that. <laughs> right? I'm not encouraging you guys to do the same thing. It's highly, I'm not saying there is no sunnah with regards to that. I just want to get it out there just in case you're getting confused. <laughs> so, and subhanAllah, you know, and, 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 and through that, you know, through this amazing thing, I mean, we didn't know about it, the, the salah. Subhanallah. You know, sometimes we think, you know, we, th we have the audacity to think, Allah needs my salah. Allah doesn't need our salah. And, and, and in the famous hadith, Qudsi, if the whole, you know, the whole of creation, men and jinn, we were to ask of Allah, you know, that in other words, they, were, they recognized Allah as the master, it would not change the position of Allah, not even a little bit. And if the whole creation, men and jinn, disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it would not take down the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not even a little bit. The salah is for us. And it starts with wudu. The amazing benefits of wudu. The rubbing of the hands. Right? In the, under the water. Releases nerves in the heart that releases... Uh, things, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the technical terms are, that relax the body. You know, it, it's, it's touching point, pinpoints of the body which calm the body down. Starting from the wudu, which is why that if you get angry, one of the remedies is to then wudu. And of course, from that we understand that, you know, anger is from shaitan, shaitan is made from fire, and when water takes out fire. It's one of the, the medical benefits, right? And salah, the positions of salah, lifting of the hands, the meditation, the breathing, the positions, everything is for our own benefit. You know, why is sujood 
another reason why sujood is the best place of salah. Of course, we are now at the closest point, right? The believer in this life, the closest we can get to Allah is when? In sujood. But also the sujood is medically the best position of salah. Why? Because now the brain is lower than the heart. This usually the brain is above the heart. And so the signal is up and down this way. When we go down to sujood, we're reversing that flow. Again, pressure off the heart, reversing the cycles. Subhanallah. It's for us. And, uh, and for these are just the medical side of things. We do it not because of the medical things. You know, it's, it's, it's the same thing because the reward will come when we do it for the sake of Allah and His Messenger. For the sake of Allah, we will get the reward for it. But for it. if we do, oh, does this? Oh, now I do wudu. Are we going to get reward? It's like smoking. For those who smoke, oh, smoking causes lung cancer. You know, oh, smoking makes my gum black. Oh, smoking, you know, and I had to have, I had to have all these ads which, you know, confirm all these things. And they say, oh, no, I'm going to stop, stop now because now they're scared of their health. Are they getting a reward for that stopping? Of course they'll get reward for stopping the haram. Right. Just imagine what the difference is if you stop because Allah said it's haram. Uh-oh, did I open up a can of worms? Did I open up a can of worms? Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't, you know, I can't escape from this fact. But this is, this is, this is, the, this is, the, I mean, this is the realities, right? And so, why are we stopping? Is it for the sake of Allah or for some other reason? We should only do anything only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the rewards will come and the barakah of Allah will come into our life. Right? And so, how did I even get to this point? Right. Oh yes, we're talking about the angels in our life, right? And the angels becoming the points that will, you know, uh, protect us. You know, sometimes we look at children, and, uh, and I look at my children, and my boys, mashallah, you know, they'll run around, this and that, and I'm sure we can all relate somehow. And they'll just come right near the table, right near the corner, and just miss it. And say, you know, and we, we could see it happening. We could see he's going to hit the corner of the table. But somehow they miss it. All things happen, right? And we know that this is all from the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know there are angels there that protect. Right? Protect us. And so the more we, the, the more we recognize Allah is our master and that we, we remain firm with regards to that, the more these angels will become a part of our life. In this world, of an akhirah. And then the angels say, وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدْعُونَ And in Jannah you will have whatever you want, whatever your heart desires, and more. Right? It's everything that you need, that you think you want, I want this, I want this, I want this, and all the things that you didn't even realize you need, you will get. Right? And the best part is, after all of that, you know, by now you're know, sort of thinking, yeah, this is amazing. Allah says, Nuzula min ghafoori rahim. This is just, what is Nuzul? Nuzul is, this is just an appetizer. We're just getting started. This is just the appetizer, guys. Everything you want, everything you want, and everything you, you, don't, you don't even realize you need, you'll get. Right? And that's just an appetizer. SubhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who achieve the consistency in this hour, to achieve this state of istiqama and achieve the blessings in our life. I didn't even realize it's already half an hour. This, this wasn't actually the topic. But I don't want to take the time from our next speaker, inshallah. So um, um, maybe um, maybe just one part from it was I was going to cover some ayat from Surah Al-Imran, uh, 193 onwards. 
And it's, it's, a, it's a famous portion of the Quran which is generally read and advised to read during Tahajjud or during the Fajr prayers. It's the ayah which starts with Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa ikhtilafi layli wa nahar la ayati li'ulil albab. And this is an amazing uh, 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 section of ayat, right? Because Allah is now talking about His creation, right? Allah is talking about the creation, you know, uh, the, the, the changing, right? Of the night and the days, right? The ayat in the, and Allah is saying, in that, there is ayat, right? Now, ayat can, you know, we know. Uh, means miracles, signs, proofs, revelations, right? Regarding to those who ponder, right? Or to those who also, you know, to those who really use their intellect, right? And then Allah talks about these people. الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَىٰ جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ And then the ayah continues with the du'as that رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ مَنْ تُنْخِلِينَ And all, all the ayahs are, are read here, right? And you can I'll, I'll advise for you to read. This is a beautiful set of ayat towards the end of Surah Al-Imran, the third uh, Surah of the Quran. And it's just a phenomenon, and uh, we're talking about and Allah is talking about the people who think. And uh, in, uh, of course, in the, in the Quran, Allah advises us and teaches us to think in many, many things. And to look at the creation, Allah swears by the creation to, to signify its, you know. I mean, Allah is talking about the changing, right, of day and night. And you'll see in the Quran, Allah swears by every moment of the changing of the sunrise and even the sunset, you know. والصبح والفجر you know, والضحى these are all different moments of the, of the mornings والعصر and all, and all the ones towards the evening there's all different names towards that time because these are times when we have to recognize the magnificence of, and, and the, the greatness I mean, if you have to, right now we take, you know, we take the changing of the day and night for granted now it's day, now it's night you know, we're used to it now but in that change is an amazing phenomenon. Amazing. The way, I mean, the things that happen in that change through the, through the life of the animals, even the changing of the cycles of nature. You know, at these moments. You know, the, the, the moment we see something, Allah provides us light to see and to recognize and to, to see what's around us. And then that light then is taken away. And the night comes along, right? And so there's an amazing phenomenon in that. And maybe another time we'll go through some of the science that we find to this amazing thing of you know of the interchanging of day and night, right? But the the point is, the pe these who are these people? Like, who are these people who think? And Allah is is, is giving us an indication and and and, uh, and characteristics of people, right? Who basically, at every moment of their life, no matter what they are doing, in fact, to no matter what position they are, they are thinking and pondering about the creation of Allah, about this, the earth and the skies, right? Yadkurun Allah qiyaman. Qiyaman is literally to stand while they're standing. But qiyam can also imp imply that in moments of standing, so whenever we are we're up, out of, you know, out of bed, and we're going wherever we go, at, in, a, in a moment of wakefulness, in a moment of going out, we're thinking about pondering, right? Maqu'udan, wa'ala jumim, sitting down or even lying down, right? Wa'itafakkarun, and thinking, and thinking. فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ right. Thinking about the amazing creation of the universe. The earth, the skies. And they become overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with the realization that Allah is there. And that he is my master. 
and they can't come to any conclusion but Rabbana. Straight away, the one that they call Rabbana, our master. Right? Ma khalaqta hadha batila. We have not created any of this in vain. Subhanak. Praising Allah. Right? So far, right, from imperfection you are, O oh Allah. Glory be to you. Subhanak. Faqina adhab al nar. And that realization, is, it's just that, it's, it's, it's a logical sequence that Allah is giving us in, that, in these ayat. That when we think and ponder about the creation of Allah, there is no other direction that this will draw us to except the conclusion that Allah is the master. And that He deserves our praise. He deserves our worship. There is no one else. Right? And then we realize that there must be the next life. There must be that other life. Right? فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ so save us from the punishment of the fire. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. It's just a logical sequence. And so I encourage myself and my dear brothers and sisters to become people who think. And thinking is not just thinking, but to study. Right? Because, you know, we can think so much. And we have this little attention span. Thinking sky, tree, clouds. Okay, what's for breakfast now? You know? <laughs> See, that's it. But we need to study. And that's why in the Quran, Allah, you know, He reminds us again and again that these signs that He gives us, these ayat, will only be appreciated by the ones who study the field, the people of knowledge. The people of knowledge, the people who understand the sciences, the ones who study the fly, right? When Allah gives the example of the fly in the Quran, the ones who understand the sciences and study the fly will really appreciate it. Those who study the earth and the skies will learn to appreciate it, the magnitude. And so we need to, you know, in order, to in order to ponder and think, we have to first study. And that's why the very first revelation ever sent down for the Qur'an to Muhammad wasallam is Iqra. Read. That's the first thing we need to do. Iqra man, yes. Right? Iqra. And the Prophet and, and, and it's phenomenon. Read. And you think to yourself, okay, that was the first ayah. That was the first revelation. There's no other Quran to read. So what are we reading? What are we reading? We are reading the creation of Allah. And to recognize and to study the understanding. Through the creation, we will recognize the power and the magnitude of our master, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to become the people who truly internalize and verbalize the statements of Qalu Rabbun Allah. That I'm not only a human being walking on the earth without a purpose. I am a slave of Allah. He is my master and I do whatever he wishes and my life is for him. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. And that is the pinnacle of the, of, the, of the belief in that man is that we reach that point that there is no doubt that my prayers, my sacrifice, my life, my death is only for Allah lillahi rabbil alameen. The master and lord of the entire universe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us his understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to study and to ponder and become people who think and truly recognize the power and magnificence of our master, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, become the people who become steadfast in this till the time we leave this world. Amin ya rabbal alameen. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
A'udzu billahi minasyaitonir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Assalamu alaika ayuhan nabiyyu. Assalamu alaina wa ala ibadillahi sholihin. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa huwa alladhi yuhyi wa yumit wa ilaihi nusyur. Allahumma wa bika asbahtu wa bika amsyaitu wa bika ahya wa bika amud wa ilaikan nusyur. Inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayuhal ladzina amanu sallu alaihi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala ali muhammad. Bapak, Ibu yang saya hormati, Alhamdulillah kita bisa bertemu kembali. Apa yang akan saya sampaikan pada subuh ahad pagi ini adalah kelanjutan dari apa yang telah disampaikan oleh Ustadz Fadil, yaitu melihat ayat-ayat Allah sehingga kita mengetahui sifat seorang Muslim itu bagaimana. Sifat seorang Muslim dijelaskan dalam sebuah hadis yang direwayatkan oleh Anas dalam uh, tafsir Al-Qurtubi. Seorang Muslim itu umpama sebuah pohon kayu. Imannya adalah akar-akarnya. Kemudian sholatnya adalah urat-uratnya. Syam atau puasanya adalah dahannya Zakat adalah rantingnya Kemudian buah Perumpamaan dari kemampuan seorang muslim dalam Ijitina bun nawahi Menjauhi larangan-larangannya Dan akhlaknya adalah daunnya Jadi di sini diungkapkan sebagai sebuah pohon kayu, tapi tidak disebutkan pohon kayu yang bagaimana. Apakah angsana, apakah jenjing, ya, apakah pohon kayu jati, itu, apakah gadog, ya, apakah bidara, cempedak, itu tidak disebutkan di sini. Ya, pohon kayu, ya, albasia, ini. Ya. Dan dalam Al-Quran juga ada uh, perumpamaan sifat seorang Muslim. Mungkin bisa dilihat dalam surat Ibrahim ayat 24. Di situ juga tidak disebutkan pohon apa gitu, karena memakai ismunakiroh itu ya. Jadi tidak pakai alif lam. Mungkin dalam bahasa Inggris itu book dengan the book kan berbeda, gitu ya. A'udzubillahi minasyaitonir rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alam taro kaifa doroballahu mathalan kalimatan thayyibah kasyajaratin thayyibah asluha thabitun wa far'uha fis sama Tidakkah engkau perhatikan bagaimana Allah membuat perumpamaan Kalimatan toibah, kalimat yang baik, kasajarotin toibatin, seperti pohon yang baik. Gitu. Dalam ilmu balagoh biasa ada musyabbah, alat tutasbih, musyabbah bihi. Ada yang diumpamakan, ada alat yang mengumpamakan, alatnya di sini kak seperti. Yang diumpamakannya adalah kalimatan toibah, ya, kalimat yang baik. Diumpamakan seperti Pohon yang baik, gitu. tapi dari sifatnya bisa kita tahu pohon apa kira-kira ini. Asluha thabitun, jadi aslun di sini asal atau akar, akarnya sabit, tetap, gitu. artinya tetap di sini e, kokoh. Kenapa kokoh? Karena e, pohon ini sifatnya akarnya mampu menerima air, kemudian menyerap, bahkan e, mengumpulkan. Nanti di saat kemarau, 
jadi bisa digunakan ya, seperti unta ya itu bisa menyimpan air gitu sehingga bisa jalan uh, dalam jarak yang jauh sekali wafar uha visama dan cabangnya di langit secari-cari dalam buku apapun tidak ada yang pohon cabangnya sampai ke uh, awan gitu tidak ada ya kita pun sudah semuanya e, mengalami naik pesawat terbang kita cari di atas awan tidak ada cabang itu ranting itu ternyata di sini perumpamaan gitu. faruha sama itu artinya pohonnya tinggi gitu. perumpamaan juga pohonnya itu banyak manfaatnya al yadul ulya khairum minal yadis sufla tangan yang di atas itu lebih baik daripada tangan yang di bawah artinya pohon ini banyak memberi nah itu sifat seorang muslim itu banyak manfaatnya nah, dari sesuai dengan surat Ibrahim ayat 24 ini ada hadis yang diriwayatkan oleh Ibnu Umar yang menunjukkan bahwa pohon kayu Nah, yang diriwayatkan oleh Anas tadi yang saya sebutkan di awal itu yang dimaksud oleh Nabi adalah pohon tamer ya, pohon kurma karena memang Islam turun pertama kali di Timur Tengah kan dari 25 Nabi yang kita kenal 20 di Palestina 5 di Eh, sekitar daerah Saudi Arabia Kalau saja misalnya Nabi itu diturunkan di Ciamis misalnya Pak <laughs> Mohon maaf ini ya <laughs> Atau di Gadog Mungkin pohon kayu jati Gadog itu yang jadi eh, eh, apa Simbol gitu Tapi ya sudah suratan takdir ya Bahwa semua Nabi diturunkan di Timur Tengah gitu. Ibnu Umar mengatakan satu saat kami bertiga yaitu Sayyiduna Abu Bakar as siddiq Sayyiduna Umar bin Al-Khattab berada di samping Nabi. Kemudian Nabi bertanya, "Tahukah kamu pohon yang seperti seorang muslim?" Ibnu Umar itu tahu jawabannya ini pasti uh, tamer gitu pohon kurma tapi karena Ibnu Umar melihat Abu Bakar diam Umar juga diam ikut diam gitu nah itu sebagai adab ya jadi kalau kita ditanya ada orang yang lebih tahu nggak usah jawab kalau orang yang lebih tahu itu tidak menjawab gitu saya gitu. oh itu jangan jadi harus diserap dulu di ini. Nah, kata Nabi, pohon itu adalah pohon kurma. Mungkin sudah sama-sama membaca tafsir Al-Misbah karangan siapa? Profesor Doktor Quresh Shihab yang pernah menjadi rektor saya waktu dulu kuliah S1 di IAIN Jakarta. Itu disebutkan pohon kurma itu banyak sekali manfaatnya, kalorinya tinggi, bahkan bisa dimakan baik mentah maupun e, matang. Ya. Mungkin kurma yang paling enak adalah Pak Abu ini yang sama Watati itu pernah ke sana, e, Ajwa mungkin ya, itu yang paling enak, hitam dan kan biasanya Nabi kalau buka puasa. Uh, dimulai dengan buka dengan tiga uh, buah kurma gitu. <tuh> nah ternyata tamar itu dalam bahasa latinnya disebut dengan dactylifera dactyl dactyl itu artinya asalnya dactulos jari vera itu vero saya memberi jadi pohon kurma pohon jari saya memberi 
dan semua yang pergi haji tidak pernah menyembunyikan kurmanya gitu pasti dibagi-bagi uh, waktu Pak Abu setelah haji tiba-tiba di dapur tuh ada kurma <laughs> Ah, gitu ya. Dan sifatnya memang orang yang pergi haji itu ya sifatnya selalu gitu ya. Ciri khasnya itu menjadi pemberi baik dari air jam-jam, kurma, kemudian apa lagi? Kitek gitu ya. Buat perempuan, ibu-ibu ya. Mana kiteknya karena karena kalau kitek dari maka itu eh, boleh dipakai salat gitu. Kemudian kayak seperti kismisnya, kacangnya dibagi-bagi gitu ya. Walaupun sedikit-sedikit gitu. Dapat berkah gitu, menjadi pemberi. Ya. Nah, kalau uh, Al-Qur'an dan Nabi ya pada satu hadisnya itu tidak menyebutkan pohon kayu yang mana, berarti bisa kita umpamakan Pohon kayu yang sabit, ya akarnya sabit, dan rantingnya itu fisama tinggi, dan memang itu hampir semuanya pohon kayu seperti itu, gitu ya. Jenjing saja misalnya, waktu saya masih SD itu, kira-kira kelas 5 kok lewat terus jalan itu ada jenjingnya. Pas kelas 6 tiba-tiba sudah tinggi sekali. 30 meteran gitu. Ternyata jenjing itu pohon kayu yang paling tercepat tumbuhnya dalam satu tahun tuh bisa 30 meteran. Pohon kurma saja kan tingginya 15 sampai 25. Gitu. Cempedak dan lain sebagainya akarnya sama itu mencekam ke bawah di Indonesia yang paling dikenal pohon kayu mungkin yang paling banyak manfaatnya adalah pohon kelapa kan yang dekat dengan ibu-ibu walaupun tinggi dia dekat dengan ibu-ibu itu Mother's Day gitu ya. dengan anak-anak dia dekat juga karena sebagai lambang pra muka Raja Muda Karana masih ingat saja pelak pelak muka pelak 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 wah kita gitu. pelak muka lambangnya apa ah. Ah. buah kelapa gitu. kenapa buah kelapa ah. uh, disebutkan satu satu batoknya bisa jadi arang batoknya bisa jadi celengan gitu terus apa kulitnya ampasnya itu bisa jadi keset Waktu itu ada kerajinan tangan, pelajaran kerajinan tangan. Membuat keset dari sabut kelapa. Nah, kemudian air kelapa yang tua bisa dibuat jadi santan. Air kelapa muda bisa dibuat jadi katanya baik untuk penyakit yang punya penyakit punggung. Gitu ya. Ini yang nggak bisa ibu-ibu, ini yang nyender mungkin punya penyakit punggung. <laughs> Punggungnya banyak-banyak minum air kelapa muda. Waktu saya belajar bahasa Belanda ternyata bahasa Belandanya kelapa muda itu dewegan. Gitu. <laughs> Dan jadi bahasa Sunda dewegan gitu ya. Nah, itu kalau ke Pelabuhan Ratu banyak sekali. Gitu ya. Dan yang enak itu ternyata yang tidak dekat-dekat pantai. Gitu. Bahkan ada lagu yang sudah masuk jadi lagu-lagu uh, pahlawan gitu ya, rayuan Pulau Kelapa gitu. Dan biasanya di radio gitu. Lambai, lambai. Jadi kita kalau menyeberang itu sebuah lautan disambut oleh pohon kelapa dia menyambut juga gitu ya dia walaupun tinggi dia rendah hati gitu, itu kelapa jadi bapak ibu sekalian sifat seorang muslim ya 
ya, kesimpulannya mungkin dia apapun yang dia miliki dari tubuhnya dan apapun yang dia kerjakan manfaatnya banyak siapakah yang manfaatnya paling banyak di antara kita dialah muslim yang lebih baik jadi muslim yang lebih baik tidak ditentukan oleh turunan siapakah dia bukan oleh tapi ditentukan oleh eh, bukan oleh ascribe status gitu, dalam sosiologi tapi oleh achieved status gitu. tapi apa yang telah dia berikan kepada orang lain gitu. apa yang telah dia hasilkan orang lain bisa eh, menikmati apa dari dia gitu. itulah yang disebut dengan seorang muslim Jadi sifat muslim sini bukan sifat alis maksud saya gitu ya. Tapi dia bermanfaat tetapi dia tidak lupa salat ya seperti tadi dikatakan karena uratnya uh, salat itu umpama urat pohon kayu. Dia tidak lupa juga puasa, dia tidak lupa zakat, dia tidak lupa berusaha untuk Ijitina bunawahi ya, menjauhi hal-hal yang dilarang dan dia juga berakhlak dan berbudi perkerti mulia. Jadi kalau kita bertemu dengan seorang Muslim, ya dia baik sekali. Tetapi pas waktu solat datang, maaf saya lagi kotor. Bagi perempuan, ya tidak apa-apa kita mengerti sedang kotor tu, sedang titik-titik gitu. Tetapi bagi laki-laki, maaf saya sedang kotor, Pak Ustaz gitu. Ini gimana sedang kotor ya? Ada saya, saya bawa celana dua gitu. Bukan saya sedang kotor gitu. Jadi tidak jelas. Ternyata ada ajaran ya semacam kalau belum betul-betul baik enggak usah salat, ada ajaran semacam itu ya. Padahal salat itu untuk menjadi seorang muslim yang baik gitu. itu tidak bisa berarti ya seorang muslim dia harus sholat dia harus zakat dia harus berpuasa dia harus berakhlak dan dia harus melakukan uh, usaha untuk menjauhkan dari hal-hal yang dilarang oleh Allah tetapi poinnya adalah semua sholat siam ibadah yang dilakukan akhlak semua yang dia lakukan Harus ditanyakan apa manfaatnya bagi orang lain, gitu. bukan hanya untuk dirinya sendiri. Ya. Sekian, wabillahi taufik walidayah warilbaw walinayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Demikian tadi Bapak Ibu uh, yang terhadap dari saya tentang sifat muslim yang ideal ya seperti perumpamaan seperti yang pohon yang sangat kuat tadi yang memiliki iman sebagai akarnya kemudian juga ada buahnya, ada dahannya yang bisa memberikan manfaat bagi manusia Sebelumnya tadi ada Ustaz Fadil tentang temanya Mother's Day ya Bagaimana tadi eh, seorang anak, kenapa ketika kita di dalam perut ibu kita, kita tidak berhenti bekerja, tidak perlu lempar koran, tapi kalau kita mendapat makanan, kita diam saja, tapi kalau mendapat makanan ketika kita dalam perut ibu kita. Karena ternyata ketika itu kita betul-betul tawakal kepada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tapi begitu kita udah mulai lahir, udah belajar jalan, udah belajar lari kita mulai merasa pede wah saya juga udah bisa sendiri sekarang, bisa nyari makanan sendiri, bisa ngambil sendiri kemudian setelah dewasa bisa bekerja sendiri kemudian kita lupa bahwa sebetulnya kita juga harus tetap kembali lagi bertawakal kadang lupa, wah saya kan sekarang udah bisa nyari uang saya nggak perlu lagi bertawakal kepada Allah padahal itu salah besar ya 
Jadi ketika sudah kita dosa harus kita kembali lagi pada bertawakal kepada Allah karena pada dasarnya apapun yang kita lakukan kalau Allah tidak menghendaki maka tidak bisa terjadi. Bapak Ibu rahimakumullah, barangkali ada yang perlu dipertanyakan kepada dosa Fadil atau Ustaz Dosef. Saya persilahkan Pak Endro Fikri yang pertama pertanyaannya. Silakan Pak Endro. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ustaz Fadil, uh, you talk about the reliance of a uh, human being uh, from God and uh, you said that uh, the reliance of human being uh, on God is a very is not very good condition for Muslims to to be closer to God and uh, I think your topic cannot be separated with the uh, growth of secularism in a Western society uh, dating back to the story of uh, Ptolemaeus in the uh, Greek Kenshin story, who stole the fire of God and then comes to the earth and then by the power of God they create, the human create science, technology and they, they're trying uh, to be the same as God and they replace the power of God on earth. Uh, and uh, since then there, there was a premise put forward by Nietzsche a philosopher from Germany uh, saying that um, the God is dead. Uh, so uh, if you take a look at the uh, phenomena in a Western society like Australia, United States and other European countries now, um, I think human beings and, and civilization are, are suffered from uh, spirituality. Um, it is interesting to know that you you are growing up in the Western uh, society, which is uh, driven by the secularisms. But at the same time, it's surprising that you can remain pious. You you can remain the, you know being Muslims, and uh, it would be very interesting to uh, to uh, uh, share if if you want to share to us how. How can you maintain uh, your being Muslim, your being Mormon, Mormon, and uh, your uh, ability to uh, be in the path of God? Thank you. Terima kasih, Pak Endro. Ustaz Fadil mengerti kan? Kalau nggak mengerti, saya terjemahkan ke bahasa Sunda, gitu kan? Tolong, tolong Pak Abu di. Saya terjemahkan ke bahasa Sunda, Pak Endro ya. Bahasa tubuh, Pak. <laughs> Silakan. Uh, saya tabung satu dulu ya. Masih ada pertanyaan lain yang lain? Oh. You can speak Indonesian, brother. Oh. Hey, this is for Fadil. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Fadil, you are talking about the sunnah and the benefits. It was very good. But there was one question. We are telling about the chickens. Like Allah can feed the chickens in whatever way He wishes. And you said one statement there, Sunnah of Allah, I can't understand that. What is the Sunnah of Allah? Is the Sunnah meant for the human beings or for Allah? So what is that all about? Can you please explain? Thank you, brother. Satu lagi? Tidak ada. Kita dua dulu saja ya. Silakan, Ustaz Fadil. Assalamualaikum. Jazakallah khair um, for the questions. Uh, we'll go with Brother Andro's question first. Jazakallah khair uh, for your insights into the um, into the uh, the difference in the secularism and the idea of growing up in the West and its challenges. I think um, living in the West and its challenges is a topic on its own. And uh, of course, uh, you asked at a personal level um, how it's possible. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is um, 
my parents have a big role. They play a big role uh, in um, in growing up here. Alhamdulillah. I think um, if my dad wasn't as strict as he was, I might have gone to a different path. Um, and so th this this brought back uh, a lot of memories and a lot of you know sometimes you think when you're young you know always coming to the mosque you know always being active and doing something not allowed to go places where all my other friends are going you know and you know dad says no and it was very tough you know and I think a lot of kids go through this phase where you know I hate my dad <laughs> you know because we don't understand uh, what um, you know some of the reasoning behind the actions and so I'd like to, uh, to first state that as, as a beginning. And of course, Hidayah is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we can try and try. And, uh, of course, the du'as, the du'as of, of the parents is all, you know, that's an amazing thing. Uh, the du'as of parents and of course ourselves making du'a for the guidance and to remain on that path. Um, living in living in the Western society, um, with all its ideas, you know, I mean, we live in a place where um, the idea of secularism, of course, number one is to take away the idea of God and that there is a Creator and replace it with science, and then the idea of taking away the concept of death. Uh, there's no, and, and if there is death, it's all in movies, and it's all about murder, and it's all dramatic and Hollywoodized, you know. It's, it's all about Hollywood to give us the extreme version of death, so that we become immune to the whole idea of death. It becomes a form of entertainment at the end of the day. Yusuf? How about it? Um, and so, it, it's, it's the... Um, it's the ideas uh, that we that we contradict um, and that we challenge through the idea or, and the ideas and beliefs taught in Islam that we are able to then um, learn about. And I think a lot can be learned through the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The story is the same, but the challenges are different. You know when early Islam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was alone, and then he you know he came and he started with his closest you know, family and friends and Islam was made secret due to the uh, you know uh, to avoid any backlash from the society which later happened when Islam became known and we know the, fa the history of the Sahabis and Sahabias who were martyred in the beginning of Islam in its inception so I mean not Islam but of course at the time of the Prophet because you know Deen is, has always been Islam anyway so uh, looking at it from that perspective as, I, as an idea being challenged. You see, at the time of Mecca, all the ideas and religions were free. There was, Judaism existed. Christianity existed. And whatever other religion, paganism and if Hinduism was there at the time. And they were all living fine together in Mecca. There was no conflicts. Everything was fine. But as soon as Islam came and Tawheed became the, 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 name, you know, the name of the order of the day, then now there's a problem because now we you know, bring this idea of Allah in, one Allah in our life. And I think when, when, when I bring it back to my own life and, with, and I think to myself, you know, everyone needs to find their way in life. And the human being was created with the understanding of a creator. The fitrah of the human being is recognized that there is a God, there is a creator, and that you know there must be a purpose in life. And, and, and the idea of the human beings. And so when the human is not fulfilling that purpose of a creator, an, a master, then that becomes replaced with something else. And I think this is where environments came into play. And Alhamdulillah, uh, 
also, you know, of th thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my parents by sending me to study in uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. so um, and so what I found is by, by, me, by my parents sending me to study in an environment which is conducive to Islamic environment studying and Islamic conduct that gave me a bit of a basis. And then coming here, the, ma the maintenance of that and trying to stick to Islamic st groups, you know, active, active in, in the masjid, even though it was pretty much forced in the beginning, you know. It was pretty much, you know, you got to come. It wasn't much choice. But I think with the balance of that harshness was the softness of and mercy of the mother and then the dua and things like that and that's that sort of brought a balance to my upbringing uh, and then you reach a stage in life where you make your own decisions and i remember even though i was you know i was practically in you know islamic uh, you know environments you know in studying in madrasas and things like that since a very young age I can personally vouch that I never really understood the things I was saying until maybe 16, 17, 18. The internal, uh, I remember the day when I used to, you know, I used to read, like I remember I was taught to give, you know, to give a, um, this is back in the tablir days, yeah? In the tablir days, I remember the six points, you know, the first one I had to give a six points, bayan. I, had, I was reading from a piece of paper, you know, and nothing made sense. And it was only when I reached the ages of uh, 17, 18, when these points made sense. And everything else that I had studied made sense. And, um, I, and, and this is just a personal experience. Of course, everyone has, you know, different experiences in life. You know, as we go and, and, and we face new experiences and new cases and new situations in life. And so... From that basis, I feel, you know, we, the principles were embedded. The seeds were sowed, you know. And it, it was just a matter of time and a bit of nurturing before this would come into some sort of fruition. That you would see something and I would see a benefit. But don't get me wrong, you know. I wish and I hope and we should all hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he counts us among the true believers. But really, when we th when, uh, the thing that motivates me now is not about how, how I'm living now, but how am I going to be living at the end of life. In other words, when, when that time comes, and I'm, am I going to be prepared? And so, and, and, and that's an important fact, you know. We can't say, you know, sometimes we're very humble, you know, we say, you know, if, uh, if Allah wants to make me a believer, inshallah, you know. We should never, the Prophet some say, we should never make a dua, you know, as make a dua and then say, in shit. You know, we can't say, oh Allah, forgive me if you want to. Oh Allah, make me a believer if you want. No, no. We should always hope in Allah for the best. You know, we should always have that optimism and expectation with Allah. And so... These are some of the principles that were embedded from the beginning. The, the effort on Iman and Amal and, you know, uh, staying with the, in, in the circles of knowledge. And, I, and, I, and, we all, and all those who are actually involved in Islamic groups and Islamic studies and Islamic organizations, you know it has its own challenges. A lot of people will get started in an Islamic organization and because of that very reason they leave the Islamic organization. Because of his own challenges in politics and things like that. And so what I believe it comes down to is the basic principles that were embedded at a very early age. And then, you know, because, you know, of course, our parents aren't going to be able to be with us the whole time. And so through that and through that nurturing and protecting the environment um, and having that realization, of course, making dua to Allah and hoping in Allah that he keeps us on the straight path 
would be some of the ingredients towards uh, remaining steadfast. Wallahu a'lam. Wallahu a'lam. I mean, the Quran is a miracle uh, in that everyone will be able to experience it in their own in their own uh, in their own version. You know, the Quran will come to the way we understand Allah. Allah subhanahu wa taala will be at the place we expect Allah to be. Ana inna zanni abdi bi. Right. I am where my slave thinks I am. I am where my th- my slave thinks I am. And so the idea of tawheed and iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are some of the most fundamental things that I believe uh, help me through. And of course, once becoming a student of the Quran, that opens its own doors and uh, its own paths towards studying and coming to the understanding and realization. And of course, Again, it's only a simple effort. You know, it's only an effort that we make and we hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can be successful inshallah. I hope that answers the question. Jazakla uh, khair brother, uh, your question was regards to what did I mean by saying the sunnah of Allah? Jazakla khair. I should have clarified. Sunnah um, by definition is method. And so when we say the sunnah of the prophet, because I mean now it's become a general term among Muslims, we say sunnah, we automatically think the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu When we say this, we can also, it's nothing wrong by saying sunnah of Allah, because we are, we, are, we are talking about the methodologies and the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, a simple example, Allah is the one who provides us rizq, right? But what do we need to do? The way that Allah, the sunnah of Allah, for us to achieve rizq, using, using, the, you know, using, the, uh, using the intellect of the human being, is I need food. Now, in order to get food, I have to afford food. In order to afford food, I need to have an income. In order to have an income, I need to look for that work to afford that income. And so that's the sunnah of Allah, that we need to make an effort before that rizq, reaches us. Like if we sit in the masjid and say, Ya Allah, I want money or I want food. Is it possible for Allah? It is possible. But is it the sunnah of Allah? No. The sunnah of Allah is for us to go make an effort. Like the bird leaves in like the famous hadith about tawakkal. By the Prophet Sallallahu when he said, tawakkal on Allah is like the bird who leaves its nest in the morning and returns back, no, it re- leaves its nest with an empty stomach and calm returns back to its nest with a full stomach. And so the idea is that the bird doesn't just sit in the nest. It doesn't just sit there and expect the worms to come up to the tree. Rather, the bird needs to go and look for the, for the, for the rizq, making an effort. The bird doesn't know where to go. But he knows he needs to make an effort. When Maryam alayhi salam just gave birth, I mean, she just gave labor on her own. There was no one holding her hand. There was no one supporting her and telling her what to do. When Maryam gave the amazing miracle birth of Isa alayhi salam, right? You can imagine her state, her condition, alone, no one around, just gave birth to a baby. How exhausted and in need of nutrition she was in. Allah could have easily caused the food to magically appear in front of her. But Allah told her, shake the tree. Allah told Maryam to shake the tree. Of course she was weak, she didn't have energy, but she had to make the effort. And then the dates came down to her. And so that is a sunnah, example of the sunnah of Allah, in that it is a methodology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's always a sabab and musabab. There's always a means and the, and, the, and the owner of that means for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom, yeah? Because we're human beings, Allah knows how, what we need to know in order to appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I hope that, uh, that answers the question. Jazakallah khair. Terima kasih Ustaz Badil. Masih ada pertanyaan? Oh, Om Peta. 
Saya persilahan Mikrofonnya sebelah mana itu Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, Untuk Ustaz Fadil um, uh, Sometimes when we read the Quran Or we We heard from somebody We We question a bit Just a bit My friend asked about the uh, What's the Quran? Quran is it's like making us confused. It's not a story. It's not history. It's not. But yeah, he talk about the Quran is just like a book. Uh, and the other side, uh, this is uh, our book for guide us to the right way. So, what if we had that like question just for a while, like one and after that? It's is so it's a way, but sometimes it's coming if it we don't really understand. So yeah, that's for a uh, second one. Ah, uh, for untuk Ustaz Ustaz ya. Ah, pasang jadi pasang jadi. Anu apa? Um, Pakai bahasa Makassar aja. <laughs> uh, kita jadi Muslim. Um. Uh, Um, kita tahu di Al-Quran ada ayat yang memberitahu kita untuk menutup kita punya eh, untuk perempuan untuk perempuan menutup eh, auratnya um, atau bagaimana adabnya perempuan eh, di masyarakat atau di lingkungan bagaimana kalau kita mau jadi Muslim yang baik Seperti apa kita lihat perempuan kita mau sekali kasih tahu bilang ini sesuatu yang penting sebenarnya atau keluarga kita uh, ada juga kalau umpamanya istri teman atau istri kita mau pergi jauh umpamanya uh, pergi conference lah anggap ada dua mingguan atau ambil data itu yang saya tahu ya. Eh, Kalau safar harus temani atau paling tidak ada bagaimana dengan kondisi itu karena teman bilang ya beda zaman lah ya udah mau gimana ya itu saya bilang bagaimana masih tidak ada jalan itu aja bagaimana kita hadapi yang begitu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Satu lagi satu lagi silakan uh, Mbak siapa itu Kusna saya nggak tahu di Aceh panggilnya Mbak bukan di Aceh. Kayaknya di Aceh itu panggilnya Inong ya, Inong Husna. Baik, langsung saja saya mau bertanya kepada Pak Usim, Pak Usep. Tadi Pak Usep sudah bilang uh, bahwasanya kitanya seorang Muslim hendaknya menjadi manfaat bagi orang lain. Nah, apabila uh, seorang Muslim itu uh, bahkan bertingkah sebaliknya, bahkan sudah menzalimi kita, begitu. Nah, kita selaku Muslim yang baik itu bagaimana caranya? Berarti kita sudah dihadapkan bahwasanya kalau kita mencegahnya kita akan memutuskan hubungan silaturahmi dengan dia Dan sebaliknya apabila tidak kita juga punya beban bahwasanya kita harus mencegah kemungkaran itu Dengan tangan atau lisan atau dengan kal itu selemah-lemah iman katanya Nah di sini saya mau bertanya yang mana lebih kita dahulukan apakah silaturahminya Ataukah mencegah kemungkarannya? Ah, begitu saja. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Inong Husna ya. Kalau orang sana macam Inong ya. Saya Fadil dulu. Jazakallah uh, khair. Um, I need to re- just make sure I need to understand the question. So is your question uh, concerning how the doubts of the Quran 
if we if we feel in doubt with the Quran. So at a personal level, you're saying, okay, what should we do if we are in doubt? Or how do we explain the doubt? Is it okay to have a doubt? Okay. Jazakallah khair, that's a very good question. Um, and of course, this also relates to a lot of, uh, a lot of us who are um, just a standard Muslim. You know, we, uh, we were born into Muslim families. And by the way, this has no, no, there's no exception whether you were born in Australia or born now in Indonesia or even, in fact, a Muslim country. Because we know that Islam or Iman, Iman is something that cannot be inherited. Islam, we can inherit the status, yeah? Yeah, Muslim katepe, right? We can understand the idea of being born as a Muslim. And so, everyone, whether we're born into Muslim families or we weren't born into Muslim families, we will all face the same question. As human beings, who is Allah? What is this Quran? Is it true? You know? And these are the challenges which every one of us will face. And for some, it must be true because my parents are Muslims. For some, it's, it must be true because everything else doesn't make sense. What does three equal one mean and, you know, all these other things out there? So, but how can we really appreciate it? So, the first thing is to address, is it normal to have doubts? It's okay to have doubts when we don't know any better. But it becomes problem when we've studied and we've been shown the proofs and we've been given the answers and we're beginning to doubt. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He opens the Quran, okay, even before, like you know, I was, I was going to say, you know, we all know the, the beginning of Surah Al Baqarah, Allah begins the Surah with Dalik al Kitab la raiba fi. You know that that is the book or this is the book where is absolutely without a shadow of doubt, no doubt. There is absolutely no doubt in this book. Now, we say, okay, if Allah said it, then it must be true. But we need to take a step back, and then we need to say, okay, do we really appreciate this as, in fact, the word of Allah? Is this, in fact, the word of Allah, the Qur'an? And um, and I've you know I've come across many many people, many many Muslims, who particularly grew up in the West, and uh, and they all have issues believing in God. Muslims, unfortunately, and this is part of the crisis that we face in the youth today, due to the culture that we live in, you know. And uh, and what they promote of you know atheism and that God can you know if God doesn't exist you know how can God exist when he you know he lets all this killing and all these you know injustices go around in the world right and there's all these questions about that so if so that that becomes a fundamental problem because if they don't believe in Allah well how would they be able to believe in the Quran? So I've, I've had a few approaches and a few ways to look at this issue and how we can address them. The first is, of course, coming back to the fundamental issue of believing in Allah. To come to that realization that Allah is truly our master. If we had to summarize the whole Qur'an, the whole Qur'an, what is the point of the Qur'an? What is the point of Qur'an? إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ that is the point of the Qur'an, right? 
to recognize that I am the slave of my master, Allah. I am a slave and he is my master. Right? So that becomes the fundamental of the Quran. Now, if we had to look at the Quran, the way that I, I used to tackle this was to prove first that the Quran is in fact a miracle. The Quran is in fact a miracle. Now, when we talk about the miracle of the Quran, the general thing that is usually, you know, the first thing that people do, if they go to Google and they go miracles of the Quran, you're going to find mostly the scientific miracles. And it makes sense. A man who was illiterate in the car, he's in the car, I think. Yeah. A man who is illiterate, didn't know how to write and read, is talking about the embryo, which technology only in the last 50 years was able to confirm. That's a miracle. Um, you know, the, the, the sciences of the mountains and the ocean, miracles. But the Quran is 30 juz, you know, 114 surahs, over 6,000 ayat. How can all of that, all of that, and how many ayat are the sciences? How many ayat? Only a handful. A small percentage is talking about the scientific nature of the, of, the, of the universe. Right? So you have that approach. Okay, well, this knowledge could have only been through the knowledge of Allah that was given to the Prophet as the revelation to Jibreel. So the strengthening of the prophethood through the proofs of these sciences. But now, right, with further study, I've come to the, the next level. And that is to appreciate the Qur'an as a miracle. A miracle of transmission. A miracle because, number one, who is the author? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in... in, in uh, in, uh, in transmission or in, in, uh, in communication, there's three aspects you have to look at, right? The first is who is talking. The second is what they're talking about. And the third is how are they delivering it? How are they talking? So with the, with the Quran, okay, we say that Allah is, um, you know, is the author. What he's talking about is the content, miraculous content. But it is the, and, and this, is, this is something that gets, that gets missed out on, is how perfect and precise and how beautiful Allah delivered the message. I mean, if the Quraysh, who were able to understand, you know, for the Arabs, they were people of poetry. For them, it was no, nothing was more important than poetry, language. That was the most important thing. That was their pride. That was the honor of them. If they were good in poetry, that would bring honor to the tribe. And so, when the Prophet came with a, with a, with a different level of poetry, the Quran, and they were mesmerized to the extent that even the enemies of Islam couldn't resist the truthfulness and the amazing nature of the Qur'an. Why is it that the Qur'an has such an effect of people that the enemies of Islam said that he is a magician? He wasn't, he wasn't doing you know, magic tricks. He wasn't you know, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. But the expression on the people's faces, uh, when, when, when he recited these ayat, that's the expression that they got. And that they would ultimately submit directly, believe in Allah. Bilal radhi anhu. One, as soon as he heard, the tahid came into his life. And no, no matter how much persecution came, he was prepared to die with saying ahad, right? That Allah, to believe that Allah is one. And so, 
what I can advise, and of course, this is not the not the uh, there's not enough time to talk and elaborate on this issue, but one of the recommendations I can give for us is to become a student of the Quran, become a student of the Quran in whatever capacity you have, whether it's once a week, whether it's just learning how to read and then learning to ultimately understand. Yes, the Quran, by definition, as Allah says in the Quran, Shahr Ramadan al-Ladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. What is the purpose? Hudan lin nas. We understand the purposes of the Quran. Hudan lin nas. It is a book of guidance for humanity, right? And so, but the guidance will only will only be given to those who Hudan lil muttaqin, that those who have taqwa. And so, the first is, of course, we want to accept these ideas of the Quran becoming that guidance for me. But we will ultimately understand when we ponder. Now, what I'm saying is, we don't have to be, we don't have to be uh, a scholar to open up the Quran to study. But what we need to have is to develop a sincere relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and say, Ya and say, Allah, I am confused. Ya Allah. Give me guidance. And then when you open the Qur'an, the Qur'an, Allah will give you what you want. The Qur'an is a book that will give you what you need. What you desire. If we understand the book Qur'an as guidance, and we open the Qur'an for guidance, inshallah, we will get guidance. But if we look at the Qur'an as you know, oh, there must be something wrong in this. Looking for mistakes, looking for errors, looking for, you know, looking for ways to misguide people, they will find that misguidance. bihi kathiran wa bihi kathira, as Allah says in the Quran. That by this book, he, mis he misguides many, and by this book, he also guides many. And it's all about how we approach the Quran. We need to realize that we first need it. Right? When Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةِ Right? When Allah says, and rush towards the forgiveness of Allah. People don't rush for something they don't think they need. People, the first thing to understand is that we need to realize that I need the for forgiveness of Allah. If, if I don't realize that I need the forgiveness of Allah, I'm not going to rush anywhere. I need to rush to work to be there on time so that my boss doesn't sack me. I need it. I, don't, I need this job. So I need to rush if I'm running late. So when we come to this realization of needing the forgiveness of Allah, needing the guidance of Allah, we have to first realize that we need it. And inshallah, Open the Qur'an, seeking its guidance. If we don't understand its meaning, see, there are many, many books, reliable books that we can search to become students. Now, what's important to attach to that is to become also students that have, you have a teacher. That's why, I'm, that's why I stress students. When you become a student, you also have a teacher. And that teacher will also be able to guide you with your questions and things that you will come up with. Because it is a lifelong struggle. As long as we live in this world, we will need to continue to pray five times a day. We will need to continue to open the Quran and seek its guidance. Five times a day, Allah stresses. He, gives, he told us, you know, in, in, just through obeying Him, the need to ask Allah continuously for guidance. Doesn't matter how pious a person is, doesn't matter how sinful a person is. Anywhere from any extreme of the spectrum, as long as we are Muslim, as long as we are in the obligation, we will continue to continue to continue to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. So, so, so just to recap, 
We need to become students and to develop a relationship with the Quran. Set aside, set aside a time of the day. And I, I recommend Fajr. Because that's what Allah subhanahu wa says. Right? In the Quran, Al-Fajr kana majura. Right? So this, the idea of becoming uh, you know, aware and setting time aside, putting aside all of our busyness, right? Aside for the sake of developing a relationship with the Quran. The Quran is a maw'idha, right? It's a maw'idha. It is a heart-touching advice from Allah. It is the advices that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give to us. And so, when we become students, we, look, we, we will be able to, inshallah, slowly, slowly, learn to appreciate. You know, when I started understanding the Qur'an, see, when I, when I first studied the Qur'an, I was only memorizing the Qur'an. I memorized the Qur'an, and alhamdulillah, I completed the memorization. And for a period of time, I was just reciting the Qur'an without really understanding it. But then, I studied the Arabic. And then I started to study the meanings of the Quran. And I studied some teachers, and began, and then the, Subhanallah, when you when you, when you get, when you get a taste of really appreciating Arabic and the power of one letter of the Quran, you will fall into this ocean of just unbelievable uh, um, of of emotions how colorful and how powerful the Arabic language is. And inshallah, this is what we should all aspire towards. Because the Qur'an, the purpose of the Qur'an is not to read. Right? The Qur'an is what is not to read. Right? What's the purpose of the Qur'an? لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِ Right? To ponder deeply about its ayat. To ponder deeply about the ayat. Not to read Surah Al-Mulk only and Surah Al-Waqi'ah and Yasin and seeking blessings. That's not the purpose of the Quran. The Quran is not there just when someone passes away and then we do khatam. The Quran is not there just to leave on, on, in the, on the window of our car or inside of our car or on the shelf in our home for barakah. That is not the purpose of the Quran. And so if that is the purpose is liyadabbaru, to make tadabbur and to think, ponder deeply about this Quran, the only way we can learn to achieve it is to when we become study, students of the Quran, develop a personal relationship with the Quran, and study its its meanings and its you know its its amazing nature through Arabic, through Tafsir, through whatever, whichever way we wish to f to approach the Quran. And when we are when when we when we then follow and walk into that path, inshallah bi idnillah taala, we will be uh, Allah will open up the doors of understanding and Allah will open up the doors of conviction. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to ponder and understand the Qur'an as the way it should be and uh, to remove any doubts from our hearts with regards to Allah, His book and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and of course of the last day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who have full conviction. I mean, I hope that answers the question. Is that okay? Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, Baik Pertanyaan dari Pak Peta dan Ibu Husna tadi Jazakumullah khairan uh, Baik sekali uh, Pertama dari Pak Peta Dalam Bagaimana menjadi seorang muslimah yang baik Mungkin kasusnya dalam bentuk keluarga ya Pak e, Misalnya tadi kalau istri akan melakukan field work Apakah harus e, ditemani Kemudian juga e, berjilbab ya, dan lain sebagainya dan Ibu Husna uh, 
menjadi muslim yang banyak manfaatnya bagaimana mengaplikasikannya dalam konteks perselisihan ketika didolimi apakah harus didahulukan mencegah perbuatannya yang dolim atau silaturahminya gitu ya. e, pertama pertanyaan dari Pak Peta itu mungkin kita perlu ingat khutbah Nabi ketika menikahkan e, putrinya yang sangat beliau cintai yaitu as Fatimah Fatimah ya. saking cintanya kata Nabi kalau aku ingin me mencium bau surga kucium leher Fatimah ya. siapa yang menyakiti yang menyakiti Fatimah maka akan menya, maka juga menyakiti aku salah satu khutbahnya itu yang menarik kepada Sayyidina Ali bahwa engkau tidaklah memiliki jadi suami tidak berhak memiliki istri memiliki kata memiliki itu juga dari bahasa Arab abunya malaka. Kalau kita hafal itu hafal betul malakatan gitu. Memiliki. Tetapi memiliki di sini artinya memperbudak. Gitu. Air. Indomie. Oh. Cuci. Padahal kita yang makan, kita yang pakai gelas tapi dibiarkan saja gitu kan karena istri ya, <laughs> belum pulang tunggu aja akhirnya Om Edi marah <laughs> nah jadi tidak boleh gitu terutama dalam hal field work tadi gitu ya gitu ulama itu ulama tasawuf biasa disebut asyuyuh kalau asyuyuh itu biasanya kalau dalam kitab-kitab Kemudian ada asyaihnya gitu, biasanya dia juga sebagai salah satu pemuka dalam uh, tarekat atau dalam tasawuf. Itu membagi kurikulum bagaimana berperilaku yang baik berbeda-beda. Tapi kalau saya uh, coba simpulkan, kurikulumnya tiga, termasuk dalam hadis tadi ya. Pertama ada kedua alak, ketiga ahwal. Dalam hadis yang diriwayatkan oleh Anas tadi, muslim yang baik itu umpama pohon kayu kan bukan hanya eh, solatnya adalah akarnya, kemudian eh, dahannya adalah eh, puasanya adalah dahannya, eh, zakatnya adalah rantingnya, tetapi juga Daunnya adalah akhlaknya, nah, itu jadi bukan hanya ibadah tapi ada akhlak. Dan para ulama tasawuf itu mengartikan akhlak itu sebagai meneladani. Jadi kalau Nabi tadi mengatakan suami itu tidak boleh memiliki istri dalam artian memperbudak, menyakiti perasaannya, eh, maka di sini. Jika misalnya istri lupa dengan jilbabnya, kemudian mau bepergian termasuk untuk penelitian lapangan, itu tidak boleh keluar kata-kata dari suami yang menyakiti uh, istri kita. Gitu. Ya kalaupun misalnya field work kemudian harus uh, pergi semuanya dengan anak yang kalau dikalkulasikan bisa jadi 4.000-5.000 sebagai sedangkan posisi apa sumber keuangan tidak mencukupi gitu. ya kita ilaskan istri saja yang pergi misalnya dan sudah ada yang menjaga di sana itu kita berdoa nah, Ustaz Fadil tadi mengatakan jangan lupa untuk berdoa berdoa hop hop gitu ya. berharap gitu roja gitu. nah bahkan dalam kitab Iya Ulumuddin itu kalau kita baca itu kan syariat Islam, tapi dalam dimensi hampir semuanya akhlak dan adab. Adab itu artinya an effort, upaya, ya, upaya. Misalnya 
kalau di mihrab itu jangan sampai kaki itu me- melonjor gitu ya. Kalau ngaji Quran, misalnya Quran ini lebih baik di atas gitu. Atau dulu waktu saya nyantri itu kalau kitab saja imriti misalnya kitab kailani tidak boleh di di apa di lantai gitu tapi dipakai di atas di bawahnya itu apa sorban gitu itu alat kalau muluda jangan sampai ke arah kiblat tuh ah, itu ya atau kalau bersin itu pakbu di sini saya pakbu oh, oh. langsung gitu ke itu ya oh, sa, sehat atau sakit ya udah tahu itu penyakit sehat atau enggak ya. nah itu kalau salaman lihat dulu tangan saya ini kotor atau enggak apalagi sudah toilet ya sudah sudah dari toilet sudah ditulis di situ harus pakai sabun harus digosok harus dry kalau enggak nanti kena gastro dan hepatitis ini udah dari toilet Oh, assalamualaikum. Aduh. Nah, itu memang bagus kelihatannya gitu ahlaknya, tapi adabnya tidak. Tidak ada upaya membersihkan tangan saya itu. Nah, itu upaya gitu, melontarkan ucapan yang baik itu adab. Ya. Uh, ya ulumuddin itu kan di situ hak orang tua pertama kali. Kemudian kita harus hormat kepada Sebelum kepada saudara laki, kepada saudara perempuan. Gitu. Kalau sudah ber, berkeluarga, tentu saja kepada istri. Tidak boleh menyakiti. Uh, konon kata sadis itu dari Marki de Sade, itu orang uh, Prancis, mabok-mabok pulang ke rumah, uh, mukulin istri dan sebagainya, sehingga dari katanya sadwe, sadis, jadi sadis. Juga sama dengan bahasa Arab, syadid ya. keras gitu, gitu ya. E, jadi nanti kalau kita sudah beradab, sudah berakhlak, Allah akan memberikan namanya ahwal, sifat hati yang waro. Gitu. Jadi kalau ah, saya nggak mau makan ini ya kayaknya mengandung ini, itu harus kita syukuri karena Allah telah memberikan sifat waro ke kita. Tetapi tidak boleh tapi dipaksakan itu kepada orang lain. Dasar lu, lu mah tinggal di Australia, keindonesiaannya sudah hilang. Makanan apa saja, nah itu sudah menyakiti. Tidak boleh. Gitu. E, terutama terhadap e, ibu kan tidak boleh mengatakan uff aja, itu sama dengan memukulnya. Katakanlah. mengatakan sesuatu yang menyakitkan kepada istri juga sama dengan memukulnya gitu. Baik. E, dari saya kira itu mungkin Pak Peta ya. Jadi e, bisa dilihat misalnya apakah diteman atau tidak dalam konteks yang lebih detail itu kondisi keuangan Di sana ada yang menjaga sudah kita hanya berdoa, gitu ya. Namun misalnya istri ingin piknik eh, perjalanan tuh pikniknya 300 kilo, ya. kemampuan kita larang misalnya. Kenapa? Bukan karena eh, ingin mengekang istri, tetapi kemampuan mobil Odisi misalnya kemampuannya hanya 100 kilo di bawah 200 kilo rejet. Dijualnya nanti susah, nah, itu misalnya gitu. Nah sekarang Bu Husna, eh, bagaimana memang kalau kita didolimi, memang ya eh, kita berhak juga untuk membalasnya. Silahkan. Gitu. Tetapi Allah itu memberikan pilihan yang lebih baik. Itu di surga itu ada almanabir. Minbar minbar yang bercahaya, gitu. Nah biasanya minbar itu di uh, peruntukan bagi para suhada, nah, syahid. Tetapi juga bukan hanya bagi suhada, bagi orang yang mampu menahan amarahnya, 
itu nanti di akhirat itu ya jadi bagi yang tidak pergi ke medan tempur masih bisa uh, punya posisi seperti para suhada diantaranya kalau dia didolimi dia maafkan gitu jadi mana yang lebih harus didahulukan apakah silaturahmi atau mencegah kedolimannya kalau menurut saya cegah kedolimannya dengan kita silaturahmi kepadanya nah, gitu. dan kita uh, berbuat baik kepadanya dalam Al-Quran disebut fa'fu wasfahu maafkan dan bersalamanlah nah, so, wasfahu di sini kan dalam bahasa Arab itu uh, lembaran itu namanya uh, apa buku itu sohifah jadi artinya maafkan dan buat lembaran baru lupakanlah gitu don't read read to the past gitu istilahnya tapi lupakan kemudian ke depan gimana gitu ya, itu lebih baik ada istilah orang Arab afatirihul jibala uh, apa angin itu menghapus gunung artinya gini kalau di timur tengah itu kalau kita jalan ke gunung kan jalan pasir kemudian ada angin dihempas uh, bekas langkah kita itu hilang jadi artinya seperti di lautan gitu ya langkah kita itu hilang oleh ombak anggaplah begitu anggap angin lalu saja kedolimannya gitu mungkin dengan kita silaturahmi dan baik dan tidak mengungkit kedolimannya mungkin dia mereka itu move gitu ya hatinya terini dalam Al-Qur'an sebutkan when kunta fadhon golidol qalbi lang faddu min haulika kalau engkau keras hati itu ya, main bolah saja langsung enggak ada orang yang dekat denganmu wahai nabi semua nanti akan pergi semua ngacir gitu anak kita pun tadi uh, Ustaz Fadil bilang I had my father gitu ya tapi itu dalam bentuk yang baik tapi kalau I had my father kalau orang tuanya suka mukul ah itu harus hati-hati gitu kan ah itu jadi nanti cari <laughs> nih nanti lontong sudah dingin gitu ya <laughs> ya baik uh, kira-kira seperti itu Musna ya sekian Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah wa ridho wal inayah Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Terima kasih Yang Sep, terima kasih Ustaz Mudah-mudahan apa yang kita dengarkan Dari pagi sampai saat ini Bermanfaat Semakin menambah keimanan dan ketahuan Kita kepada Allah Subhanahu SWT Terima kasih kepada ibu-ibu yang sudah membawa Hidangan lontong, cak lontong Mudah-mudahan Menjadi amal soleh yang menjadi bagi kita semua kita akhiri dengan doa kifaratul majlis subhanaka allahumma bihamdika asyhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik mohon maaf kalau ada kekurangan akhir kalam assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh karena sudah dingin kata Ferry ibu dipersilakan untuk langsung segera supaya tidak terlalu dingin